March 4, 1933, a gray and cold Inauguration Day. Outgoing President Herbert Hoover and incoming President Franklin Delano Roosevelt had on their winter coats, and they had blankets wrapped around their legs as they rode side by side in an open touring car from the White House to the east portico of the Capitol building for Roosevelt swearing in. There were secret ramps set up so that FDR could wheel himself nearly all the way to the stage. And then with the help of his son James, he propped himself out of the wheelchair and walked slowly to the lectern. He stared out at the crowd of Americans who were gathered there to watch his inauguration during these dark days of the Great Depression. And he took the oath of office. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Roosevelt's hand was on his family's 250-year-old Dutch Bible. The page was open to 1 Corinthians 13, which has the words... Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I'm Lillian Cunningham with The Washington Post, and this is the 31st episode of Presidential. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. What your country can do for you is to live in infamy. This episode is about love, in a way. FDR had four terms in office, 13 years, so instead of spending a lot of time on the nuts and bolts of the New Deal and World War II, we're going to do something a little different and examine the presidency and leadership style of FDR through the prism of Eleanor Roosevelt. We do first need a picture of Franklin, though, before Eleanor and Franklin are a pair, So my first guest is the director of the FDR Presidential Library and Museum, Paul Sparrow. Well, so happy to be with you. So, Paul, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was born in 1882, Hyde Park, New York, and at the very estate where his presidential library is now. So um, what was life like for him growing up there? Well, it's about a thousand acres on the Hudson River right here in the middle of the Hudson Valley, and it's just a an incredibly beautiful location. His mother had a very difficult childbirth, so he was the only child. Uh, His father was much older than his mother. He really was um, the apple of their eye. I mean, they devoted themselves to his life. So he had everything he wanted. Uh, This was a wonderland filled with animals. He would sail in the summer and ice boat in the winter. So his upbringing here really deeply influenced him in terms of his later policies, the way he created national forests and national parks, and gave him a deep sense of sort of confidence in himself. Uh, They would often go to Europe for months at a time with Franklin and take him to the world capitals. He spoke German fluently. Uh, They spent a lot of time in Germany. So that sense of the world as as a larger place also influenced Franklin very much. He had a very sophisticated worldview, even at a fairly early age. So um, he goes off to Groton, the prestigious boarding school, and then to Harvard. His father dies shortly after he starts college. What is cementing itself in him during this time? What sort of character traits and also political propensities are starting to show themselves? His Harvard years, you look at them and you don't find anything that would indicate the sort of greatness that was to come. He had this enormous self-confidence. He had this ability to focus on the things that he wanted to do, uh, but there was nothing that you would describe as extraordinary. It was almost like he was biding his time. 
he's not a particularly outstanding student. I mean, he was popular and he was effective, but he was not number one in his class or the, you know, the great school leader or a great athlete or anything. Now, this was a period when, obviously, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was emerging as a major political leader. And I think that influenced him probably more than, than anything that happened to him at, at college. They were both progressives, but technically FDR was a Democrat, while Theodore Roosevelt at that time was a Republican. Anyway, it's around this time that Eleanor enters the picture. And so with me to talk about her now is Alita Black, the founding editor of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers, and also um, a professor at the George Washington University. So thanks so much for being here, Alita. Oh, Lillian, I'm very excited. Thanks for having me. So what was Eleanor's childhood like? And, you know, how is it that she and Franklin strike up a relationship? Well, you know, Lillian, one of the things that's so amazing to me about Eleanor Roosevelt is the extent to which she transcended her childhood. I mean, her childhood was really dominated by fear and and disappointment. Her mother was one of the most beautiful women in New York and was convinced that her daughter was the ugliest child born in the universe, so ugly that she called her granny. And her father was an alcoholic who became addicted to medication after he hurt his back in a sporting accident. And so while she worshipped him, he would often forget her. And so she was torn between love that disappointed her and love that told her that she wasn't worthy. And here she is. She becomes a woman whose life is defined by combating fear. And that's one of the things, I think, that really attracted FDR to her. Mm -hmm. I mean, granted, she was Teddy Roosevelt's niece. I mean, that didn't hurt either. So her father was Teddy Roosevelt's brother. Yes, and um, and so Franklin and Eleanor had sort of a distant They were fifth cousins once removed. Mm-hmm. And while they had met when they were young children, the interest in each other, the spark, so to speak, happens when Eleanor comes back from London after going to school and they run into each other on a train going from New York to Poughkeepsie and Tivoli, their respective homes. From what you know about Eleanor, um, what would FDR have been like on a date? What was it about him that attracted her? What did she find in him as a a good complement to her personality? Well, you know, they really were exact opposites, but they had very core beliefs. And I think what they saw in each other was something that no one else saw. She didn't see him as a dandy, as a pretty boy who had all this ambition and no skill. She saw a serious side of him. And he saw in her a kindred spirit, I think, that was not only just the Roosevelt legacy and not this sense of duty, but this fierce passion, this commitment to risk herself to make the world better. I mean, she wasn't your normal debutante. And so Franklin was very close with his mother, who famously wasn't very supportive of the idea that he would propose to her, right? Well, let's just say there were always three people in this marriage. Sarah very much thought that Eleanor was not worthy enough of FDR, although she ultimately changes her mind and becomes Eleanor's fierce ally. Why was it to begin with that she didn't think she was worthy? Well, no woman would be good enough Mm. for FDR for Sarah. (laughs) FDR was the sole focus of Sarah's life. And so no one could ever live up to the love or the expectations that she had for her son. And Eleanor was shy. You know, Sarah had some concerns that maybe FDR was falling for Eleanor because he was on the rebound. But she ultimately came to love and admire and cherish Eleanor. You had mentioned how she was sort of naturally shy. Maybe if you could do just a little compare and contrast between the natural sort of leadership gifts Uh that FDR had and Eleanor had and how both of them, what each of them sort of had to work on um, over their careers. Well, if there was ever a child who was in a household that made a child feel unworthy, it was Eleanor. If there was ever a child 
who felt like that they could do anything in the world without failure, it was FDR. Hmm. So they come from diametrically opposite childhoods. What happens to Eleanor is that she goes to school in London at the Allenswood Academy, which is basically where Center Court Wimbledon is now. And she was taught by this extraordinary woman, Marie Chouvest. And Marie Chouvest saw in Eleanor greatness. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. And Eleanor became her pet. And Marie Chouvest pushed her. She pushed her to read everything, to learn multiple languages. And she says to her, you will never know what you think until you can argue the position of your fiercest critic with equal respect. And Eleanor writes one day, I finally learned that I have a brain. I have argued the Boer War with Mademoiselle, and I have won each time. And Mademoiselle Chouvest lets her stay with her during the summers, and they travel together. And she teaches Eleanor independence and teaches her the most fundamental thing. When you travel, you are a guest in a country. So you just don't go to the opera or to the fashion shows. You volunteer in hospitals. You volunteer in settlement houses. You volunteer in soup kitchens. And so she showed Eleanor the world outside of a world that Eleanor had ever experienced. And so when she leaves Allenswood, Marie Chouvest gives her a letter that Eleanor will carry with her for years. And it basically says, of course, she must go home and make your debut. You are a Roosevelt. But first and foremost, you are my Eleanor. And I expect great things from you in your own right in this world. And so Suvest helped Eleanor become a leader, so much so that Eleanor would have a picture of Mademoiselle Suvest in her office, in her bedroom, and in her living room everywhere she lived. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they come to leadership differently. They come from FDR being confident and entitled and curious and ambitious and fascinated with his cousin Teddy. And Eleanor comes to it through a a, sort of an innate curiosity, a heart connection, and a primal understanding that to live a life worth living, you must transcend fear. Franklin and Eleanor marry in 1905, a year or two after college, and Franklin has a brief law career in New York City before he's elected to the New York State Senate in 1910. It's at that time that he strikes up a friendship with Louis Howe, who is a journalist turned political advisor who will help shape the rest of FDR's life. And Louis Howe, I guess you could say, would be, oh, a combination of David Axelrod and Paul Begala personalities. Mm-hmm. Although he was tiny. I mean, he was like five feet three, was a gnome. He chain smoked. He was always <laughs> covered in cigarette ash. Had horrible asthma. Coughed more than I do. <laughs> and um, he saw in FDR the spark of a president when FDR was serving his first term in the state legislature and really began to take FDR under his wing and taught him how to give speeches and and manage the press for him. And so he helps FDR climb the next rung up the political ladder, which is a big job as Assistant Secretary of the Navy during World War I while Woodrow Wilson's in office. But then in the span of a few years, there are two big personal events that really shake Franklin and Eleanor's marriage and their lives together. One was that in 1918, Eleanor realizes that he's been having an affair with her social secretary, Lucy Mercer. And then the other is that in the summer of 1921, FDR ends up with polio and paralyzed from the waist down. Um, Well, Lillian, I really like the way that you pair those because it shows the full range of the Roosevelt marriage and their ability to love one another in new ways. I mean, Eleanor was 
devastated. It was a double whammy when she discovered the love letters from Lucy Mercer to Franklin. Not only had Franklin betrayed her, but he had betrayed her with a woman who was her right hand, her social secretary. And she leaves, offers him a divorce. Sarah comes in to mediate. They reconcile. And the thing that is marvelous about the Roosevelts is that they learn to love each other in new ways. I mean, they get past this sort of teenage movie star idealistic love to a love that's based on mutual respect, trying to build a new life together, one that they want, one that they see for themselves rather than one that's sort of forced on them. Mm -hmm. So the polio and the paralysis, how does that change their relationship as well? It doesn't just make her a caregiver, right? It also in a way makes her No, I mean, the thing that's so remarkable to me about polio is what it says about both of them. Because Eleanor had just developed her own independent life. She and FDR had figured out how to be together and be a couple, but be their distinct personalities at the same time. She was beginning to be an activist. She had a life of her own, making her own friends. And all of this prompted and all of by this, the and, affair. And then all of a sudden, when FDR has polio... It's not just his legs that are immobilized. It's his entire body. I mean, Eleanor has to learn to insert a glass catheter. She has to give him enemas. She has to lift him up, turn him over. So there's a new level of trust and intimacy that develops. You go from the brokenheartedness of Lucy to the intense partnership of polio. Because she understands that FDR has to believe that he will walk. And she will not allow anyone to tell him that's not possible. So she reinforces his fierce will, his unbridled confidence, and for the first time, stands up to Sarah and says, Mama, You cannot go in there and tell him that you are taking him back to Hyde Park. The last thing he needs to be is a gentleman squire. And so in many ways, I think polio had a major effect on him. When you're born in privilege, you know, when you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth and you're pampered, 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 pampered. I mean, there's a huge arrogance Mm -hmm. that comes with that. And what polio did to him was tamper that arrogance and, in Eleanor's words, give him patience and never-ending persistence. And so when he had to rebuild his life and his whole image of himself, what he could do for his country and what his marriage would be like and how could he play with his children, you know, there's just this ebullience that was there that you just couldn't You couldn't get rid of it. I mean, you never heard FDR say he was never going to walk again. Polio is the defining part of their marriage as well as FDR's character. So because of his polio, Eleanor also ends up almost his surrogate um, in a political capacity for a while, right? Because she's going out to these events that he can't attend. And so how does that also transform their political identity. Well, that's the story that Eleanor wants told. Eleanor wants told that she only became political after FDR got polio. In reality, she's poli- she's very political before polio sidelines him. Mm-hmm. And so she's already developing the skills. What happens now is that she does it much more often and in a greater arena. Not only For her issues, which are the living wage, sanitation, education, old age pensions, the right to organize, but for his issues, because FDR from 1921 until 1928 will spend most of his time away trying to find a cure. So for six months in each year, they will be apart. 
So while FDR will write letters and become, you know, a leader in the National Party, it's Eleanor who becomes the leader in the State Party. And she and Louis Howe develop a great friendship. And Louis so believed in Eleanor that he also thought that he could make Eleanor president. Which is a remarkable thought for the time. (laughs) A huge thought for the time. I mean, Eleanor just thought, are you crazy? But he taught Eleanor how to work a room and also helped her writing style. And in 1928, when Al Smith asks FDR to succeed him as the Democratic governor of New York, he does so, he tells a close aide, and this is a direct quote, because Eleanor is more well-known among the party faithful than anyone in the state. So FDR does win the seat to become governor of New York, yet it was during those six or seven years beforehand that many of the views he'll take to the White House began to coalesce. Here again is Paul Sparrow. That period in there between when he contracts polio and when he runs for governor of New York in 28 is critical to understand how he developed a lot of his policies in the New Deal. Uh, Because during that period, he discovered Warm Springs, Georgia. And he went down to Warm Springs, Georgia and sort of converted this into a polio rehabilitation center. And he bought a home down there. But it immersed him in one of the most brutally poor areas of the country. He saw the incredible plight of these uh, sharecroppers and these tenant farmers and how extraordinarily oppressed they were by the system. And I think it developed in him at that moment as he was recovering from his own polio, uh, a great empathy for these people and an understanding that America could never live up to its ideals if it didn't address this extraordinary inequality and the, the abject poverty that these farmers were suffering. It's one of the things that motivated him, for example, for the whole Tennessee Valley Authority. He wanted to bring electricity to these poor rural areas because he knew without electricity they would never be able to develop, they would never have industry, they would never have commerce. And so that period was formative and I think it really strongly influenced him in many of the policies you see him implement once he gets into the Oval Office. So FDR goes from recuperating in Warm Springs to being governor of New York during the start of the Depression and then he wins the presidency in the 1932 election booting Herbert Hoover out of office. In 1932, when the election took place, America was at its most desperate situation in our history. Uh, More than 30% of the population was unemployed. At that point in time, the federal government had no responsibility. If you are starving in the street, the federal government had no responsibility to help you. And banks were closing at the rate of hundreds every week. Huge swaths of the Midwest Uh, were suffering from a terrible dust bowl. Uh, Industry had collapsed. It was a desperate time. Uh, Hoover was trying anything he could to fix the economy, but it was just spiraling out of control. So at the moment he took office, it was really dark period. And so America turned to him to do something. And as he said, you know, try something. If it doesn't work, try something else. The two overriding characteristics of Franklin Roosevelt were his extraordinary optimism and his confidence in his own abilities. Uh, He believed that he could make America great again after this terrible depression. Um, He strongly believed in his own personal uh, charisma to convince people to do the things that he wanted them to do. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat. This is FDR's first inaugural address in March of 1933. He came into the White House with a massive agenda called the New Deal that was designed to lift the country out of its economic depression. 
It included iconic programs like the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Civil Works Administration, the Federal Housing Administration, the Public Works Administration, the Social Security Act, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the Works Progress Administration, the Emergency Banking Act, Ditching the Gold Standard, the Glass-Steagall Act, the FDIC, the Food Stamp Plan. Now, Roosevelt had Democratic majorities in both the House and the Senate when he came into the White House, which was a big part of how he was able to push through so much of this legislative agenda in his first hundred days. But there was also another factor that helped him advance his agenda, and that was his really powerful communication style. With me to talk about how FDR persuaded the American people to support all of these very progressive plans is one of the current president's White House speechwriters, Sarada Perry. Thanks for being here. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, Sarada, even from this very first inaugural address that FDR gives with the iconic line that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, we start to see how oratory is a key tool in his leadership toolbox, right? So what was so effective? It it seems like he takes a very different rhetorical approach than Hoover, who we heard last week how Hoover tended to try building public confidence by essentially playing down the problems and saying, oh, things aren't that bad. You know, this this speech was kind of an attack, I think, on the psychology of the Great Depression. You know, the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. I mean, he goes through this really honest accounting of the nation's woes in a way that that Hoover just hadn't done, that really nobody had done. And suddenly all of these people who've been suffering are realizing that their leader is hearing them, is understanding where they are. Um, This is kind of a a direct counter to how Hoover was behaving. Then, you know, immediately after, he says, this great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. He's not saying that everything's okay right now, but he's saying we we will get there and and that we always have. Um, And he does this a lot. He sort of draws on history to say we've always gotten out of sticky situations we're in and we'll do it again together. Um, And to sort of immediately inject action was enormous at the time because Hoover had shied away from action, especially government action, right? So he was saying, we have a crisis at our hands. You all are suffering, but we can actually do something about it. And when I say we, I mean we the people, our government, our system of self-government. Throughout the speech, as as you go on, he's basically quite slowly justifying this enormous expansion of executive power, Mm -hmm. um, but he's doing it within this sort of psychological argument. I mean, it's, it's an injection of confidence right off the bat as soon as he gets up there. And I think in a way, this wasn't just a repudiation of Hoover's policies. It was a repudiation of Hoover's communication style. And so this mix of straight talk and optimism becomes FDR's signature type of rhetoric throughout his presidency, really. I think his great gift um, was to understand the public climate and to trust that he could acknowledge where they were and then also move them along to where they needed to go. Well, in his series of fireside chats on the radio, were a great example of this, right? He treated these radio addresses almost like an ongoing conversation with the public where he could slowly explain and build his policy case over time. And that was new and unusual. So I think it's worth kind of just thinking about the fireside chat first as a, as a medium, right? So Roosevelt comes into office and radio is getting bigger and he immediately grasps this technological revolution. He understands the power of radio and he understands that in order to succeed in this medium, he needs to shift the way delivering speeches happens. So if you think about time before then, you imagine people getting up on on a stump and delivering these formal speeches. They were long. You had to make it worth the while of people who were coming a long distance to see you speak. Um, You maybe didn't have a microphone, and so you were shouting, and um, you got to make sure that the person in the back can hear you. So now we, we come up with this technology that is totally different. You are now in people's living rooms. You are with them. My friend... I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. Roosevelt grasped exactly what that meant for his style, and it worked perfectly because he naturally had a more conversational style um, and this lovely tone of voice. And he and he was very interested in making sure that people understood what he was actually talking about. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days and why it was done and what the next steps are going to be. 
I recognize that the many proclamations from state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average citizen. On the banking crisis, what's so interesting about this is voice just sounds really calm. And remember, the country is falling apart. I mean, it's not really an exaggeration to say that the economy is in tatters and, and people are freaking out. And he kind of very calmly explains what he's going to do. And he's treating the American people like intelligent consumers of information. He once said that before each fireside chat, um, I tried to picture a mason at work on a new building, a girl behind a counter, a farmer in his field. He tried to picture the actual American people and what they were thinking and what they were feeling and how he could reach them. You know, what he understood about great communication is that even if you're the president and you're giving some sort of high-flying speech about intricate policy, everything starts with empathy. Eleanor also ends up using radio and media very powerfully to help FDR's agenda. But unlike FDR, who gave that first fireside chat on the banking crisis only a week into his first term, it takes Eleanor a bit longer to establish what her role will be in the administration. The first thing she has to do is she has to convince FDR to let her do something. Because FDR makes her resign all her positions. She can no longer teach. She's on the board of 17 major organizations. And FDR says, you got to stop. And she says, well, Franklin, let me help you with your mail. He says, no. Well, let me go out and travel for you like I did when, when you were governor. He says, no. And she's terrified and very sad of living a life confined to what she called white glove tests. You know, like wearing a white glove and running it down the banister of the White House to make sure it's dusted properly. So she has to figure out how to have her voice heard. And the Monus Army is encamped in Anacostia, and they're World War I veterans, and they have lost everything in the Great Depression. Everything. They're living in old military tents with their families. They're living in tents made of newspaper and corrugated cardboard, and old, rotty clothes. And Hoover really lost the election by sending the army to dislodge the bonus encampment. And so Louis and Eleanor drive over there. Now, I want you to think about this. Eleanor has refused Secret Service protection. She drives her own car. She's just out and about in Washington going to a hobo encampment, and she stays there for hours. She eats beans with her fingers out of a paper cup. She asks them what their lives were like. You know, she asked what their expectations are. And so the next day, the New York Times and the Washington Star both have the same line uh, emboldened in the story. Hoover sent the troops, FDR sent his wife. Mm. And so FDR begins to realize that Eleanor can be good copy. And so she begins to go out. She also starts writing her own monthly magazine column. And it's called Mrs. Roosevelt's Page. And the first article is entitled, I Want You to Write to Me. And it comes out the end of August. You know, they've, they've been at the White House five months. And she says, you know, we've done all these programs. We've done bold, persistent experimentation, but we don't know if it's working. The only way we're going to know if it's working is if you tell us your experiences with it. So write to me. Tell me about your lives. Tell me about your needs. Tell me if you think these programs are working. The thing that's so stunning is that from August 31st to December 31st, Eleanor Roosevelt gets 350,000 letters. And so what both she and FDR are doing is really building a relationship with the American people and the federal government. And Eleanor is, of course, also championing particular causes like women's rights, civil rights, advocating to help the young, the poor. She was the conscience 
of FDR's administration. She had an unwavering sense of right and wrong. And she would always take the position of what was morally right. Franklin was much more the political pragmatist. I don't want to lose this state. I have to negotiate for this. This congressman's not going to support this. He wanted to find the solutions that would get things done. And Eleanor wanted him to do the right thing. She was his most vocal critic internally. And often he would use her to go out and say things to gauge the public's reaction. And then if the public's reaction was positive, he would embrace those positions and, and make them happen. If the reaction was very negative, he could back away from it and say, oh, that's just my wife. You know, I have no control over her. But of course, they worked very closely. One day early in his administration, FDR instated the Economy Act, which put a number of female government workers out of jobs who were married to male government employees. And that was one early example where Eleanor didn't just act as FDR's conscience in private. I mean, they have dueling editorials in the same papers. She criticizes it publicly. That publicly. She's like, immediately, she's out there. She's like, no. And it takes a while, but in 1935, she changes his mind, and the women are rehired. And there are also several initiatives where Eleanor is actually the main proponent herself, right? She's not just supporting or challenging or reacting to FDR's ideas. She took the greatest sense of accomplishment, I think, in 1935 from two programs. The first is the National Youth Administration, which really is the precursor to AmeriCorps today. Mm -hmm. The other thing that she does that is of long-lasting importance is Eleanor really is the number one advocate for the Federal One programs, the Federal Writers Project, the Federal Dance Project, the Federal Theater Project, you know, because artists and musicians and archivists and librarians, and they're out of work. They're starving. And so what they do is they are put to work performing for the American people. Zora Neale Hurston writes, their eyes were watching God while she is working for the Federal Writers Project. Wow. John Steinbeck writes, the grapes of wrath. She also took a very public stand on civil rights when she resigned from the DAR because the DAR wouldn't let the famous black singer Marian Anderson perform in its hall. And so it's not just that Eleanor resigned, though, right, but that she actually helped arrange for Anderson to perform at the Lincoln Memorial instead. She made civil rights much more of a national issue. When she resigns from the DAR on February 27th, 1939, it goes on the front page of 483 newspapers. And so when Marian Anderson sings at the steps of Lincoln, you know, that transforms the Lincoln Memorial into a civil rights monument. And Eleanor very much arranges for the radio broadcasts to occur. And that's the first live coast-to-coast broadcast music event in the history of radio. During their time in the White House, Eleanor gave somewhere around 300 radio addresses, which is about the same amount as the FDR did. Um, What were her programs like, and how did they complement or run counter to the sort of radio programming that FDR had? The most stunning radio address she gave was um, December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor Day. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm speaking to you tonight at a very serious moment in our history. And the voice the nation hears first is Eleanor's. It's not FDR's. Eleanor had a regularly scheduled radio broadcast that afternoon, and um, she took the first roughly four minutes of it to speak to the American people. You know, and she says... For months now, the knowledge that something of this kind might happen has been hanging over our heads. And yet, it seemed impossible to believe, impossible to drop the everyday things of life 
and feel that there was only one thing which was important, preparation to meet an enemy no matter where he struck. That is all over now, and there is no more uncertainty. We know what we have to face, and we know that we are ready to face it. And then she ends it on this, and I, you know, on this ultimate triumphant, resolute, no, you know, she says, You cannot escape anxiety, you cannot escape a clutch of fear at your heart, and yet I hope that the certainty of what we have to meet will make you rise above these fears. And so that really sets the stage for the president's address to Congress the next day. We are the free and unconquerable people of the United States of America. So the day of infamy speech was an address to Congress um, that FDR gave on, on December 8th, 1941, the day after um, Pearl Harbor. Uh, Sam Rosenman and Robert Sherwood were in New York. So his speechwriting team is basically gone. It's all him. So he just dictated the speech to his secretary, Grace Tully. And as she describes it, he leans back, takes a long drag on his cigarette, looks up on the ceiling, and dictates the first draft of the speech in one pass. No stopping. She then goes and types it up, brings it back to him. It's about two and a half pages long, and he carries that speech around with him all day, and he's making little notes. And of course, he makes one of the most famous edits in history. In his original draft, it says, Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in world history. The United States of America was simultaneously and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Well, then, as he's editing draft number one, he crosses out world history and he replaces it with infamy. And he deletes simultaneously and he changes it to suddenly. And at the end of that sentence, he had actually added without warning. And then he crossed that out. So the sentence we end up with is... Yesterday... December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. And if you think about that word choice change, from that will, it will live from world history to infamy, um, it's not just a rhetorical flourish. It's, it's actually, it gives greater meaning. He is making a judgment call about what this moment is. Um, it is an act that is treacherous and that re- requires some kind of response. And it's part of what, what speech writing is about, which is clarifying to the point of finding the right word. And so when you listen to his speech, it's only a little over six minutes long. It is beautifully structured. It is precise in its definitions of what happened and what's going to happen. And it's brilliant in its passion and anger, but at the same time, unrelenting confidence. America will prevail. So help us God. And that's the message that he knew the American people needed to see at that point. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. As America enters World War II, how does the dynamic between Eleanor and Franklin change? During the pre-war years, they are much more um, in sync. They are more collaborative. They have the same priorities. When the war comes, their relationship changes dramatically. First of all, Louis Howe, who really was the broker between them, is dead. And so the one person that could treat both of them as equals is no longer on the scene. Mm. And Harry Hopkins, who was the great social reformer and the architect of the extraordinary work relief programs, moves into becoming basically an assistant president for the war and totally uh, puts all of his devotion with FDR. And Eleanor believes that the lesson of World War I is that we won the war, but we lost the peace, meaning that we had military victories. But when we came home, we didn't really capitalize on our image as the savior of democracy to make America more democratic. I mean, for example, she will say, why curse Hitler and support Jim Crow. And so as FDR says, 
say goodbye to Dr. New Deal and hello to Dr. Win the War, Eleanor that afternoon will have her own press conference and say, I, for one, will not put the New Deal away in lavender. And they're not together much. She travels more. He is closeted more with his military advisors. And so a painful distance develops between the two Mm -hmm. of them. And so this isn't a strategic split to say, well, you focus on this thing, I'll focus on the home front. No, it's not strategic. It's It's that their their priorities really are Well, I mean, if FDR wanted to stop it, he could have stopped it. I think it's particularly evident in the Japanese internment story. Eleanor Roosevelt was adamantly opposed to the idea of locking up American citizens of Japanese descent. She argued vehemently not to do this. Uh, But FDR was under tremendous pressure from the military, from Southern Democrats, from a lot of the uh, West Coast politicians. They wanted these Japanese citizens locked up. And she fought him tooth and nail right to the point where he had to say, Eleanor, you can't fight me on this. Stop it. So after Executive Order 9066 uh, is issued in in February of 1942, what does Eleanor do? She goes to visit the camps. Um, Eleanor is fighting to adopt Japanese-American families to let Japanese men who want to fight, fight, to improve the conditions in the camp. And my favorite example of this is the man who led the riots in Manzanar's name was Togo Tanaka. All of his belongings were destroyed in the camps. But he had a daughter and named his daughter Eleanor after her. So what Eleanor does is to say that race is a problem we cannot hide in our closet. Democracy will progress as long as race progresses. And we are all on trial to show what democracy means. FDR is elected to the presidency in unprecedented four times, and his last swearing into office is on January 20th, 1945. This is right when World War II is starting to turn toward Allied victory, but the war is still very much raging. By 1945, I think the Roosevelts still loved each other. Well, I know the Roosevelts still loved each other. I just don't think they knew how to love each other in a way. They had become so much partners in trying to help the nation that they were not partners in helping each other. Eleanor was on the road so much in 43, 44, and 45. And FDR had so much pressure with the war. They had become not strangers, but distant in a way. And... FDR had asked Anna, his daughter, to help arrange for Lucy to come back in the White House when Eleanor was away. This is Lucy Mercer, the woman who FDR had the affair with decades before. In April 1945, FDR goes down to Warm Springs, Georgia, with Lucy. And while he's there with her, he has a cerebral hemorrhage, and he dies. And so once again, Eleanor finds out that Lucy is back in FDR's life. And she takes the train from Washington down to Warm Springs. She goes into his bedroom and sits with his body for a few minutes in a very private, intimate way and comes back out and arranges for the body to be brought back to Washington. It's a 16-hour train ride. And as they put the casket on a, a dray, all the people of Warm Springs just turn out, all the farmers. And Eleanor sits in the window of the train and stays awake the entire time and watches all of the American people along the railroad. She was sad for herself, but she was just, I think, grief-stricken for the American people because of all the outpouring 
that they saw. I mean, remember, I mean, sure, people hated FDR. You know, people hated Eleanor. But he was the most beloved, and she was the most beloved person in the world. And he had been president for 13 years. And the war wasn't over yet. And so she she carried that. And then she had to decide, you know, what was next for her and what she could do. And people came to her to ask her to run for the Senate from New York or be Secretary of Labor or um, be president of a college, you know. And she just says, you need not worry. My voice will not be silent. But she felt like if she was that public, it would somehow weaken or disparage FDR's legacy. And so Eleanor will go to her grave lying, saying that she never influenced FDR on policy, you know, and totally obscuring the role she had in setting up the United Nations, you know, the role that she had in domestic policies in the United States. And how does she die? Um, She died of tuberculosis that was misdiagnosed, but uh, she was with it till the end. I mean, always prodding, always challenging. She had 103 fevers. She was bleeding from the inside of the throat, but she stayed alive to finish her last book, Tomorrow is Now, which was written to young people. You know, and she says, staying aloof is not a solution. It is a cowardly evasion. I mean, Eleanor would say, courage is more exhilarating than fear. And in the long run, it is easier. All we have to have is the courage to face ourselves in the mirror and take one step at a time. this week's guests, Alita Black, editor of the Eleanor Roosevelt Papers, Paul Sparrow, director of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum, and Sarada Perry, presidential speechwriter at the White House. Original music for the podcast is by Dave Wessner. And just a small correction from last week. Herbert Hoover has not had the longest post-presidency ever. He just had the longest one up until his death. Astute listeners wrote to tell me to clarify that, so thank you. Next week, one of my favorite guests is back. We will be talking about the presidency of Harry S. Truman with biographer David McCullough. <laughs> 